Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to summarize the current discussion from a nephrology perspective. And I would like to start straight away with reminding you that the concept of treating renal anemia, which was uh, to a large extent promoted by these two gentlemen, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with them, was originally based on the concept to improve symptoms and to improve prognosis, but prognosis only in so far as the transfusion requirement would be, re would be reduced. Now, over the years, what we have all witnessed is that the objective of this kind of treatment in patients with kidney disease has shifted away from these original intentions. And this shift in the objective is, basic, is mainly based on observational studies, a large array of observational studies, consistent observational studies, showing that the hemoglobin values in patients with kidney disease are inversely associated with comorbidity, left ventricular hypertrophy, progression of chronic kidney disease, and mortality. And in addition to that, and fitting this concept, there is uh, an interesting and plausible hypothesis that improving oxygen availability might have an impact on the complications of these individuals. And this for sort of led to the hypothesis that actually increasing the hemoglobin into the subnormal range would allow us to achieve the maximum benefit from this kind of therapy. Now, obviously, this has changed as uh, is in, in the public. Uh, and the reason why it has changed is mainly the trial situation. And the reason that it had to be changed is that the sort of shift in the treatment paradigm occurred without any of the hypotheses really being tested. And now we have tested it more rigorously. And what I would like to show you here is the clinical trial situation that is available. As it, and I believe it does also, to a significant extent, reflect the history behind what I've just tried to summarize. These are all randomized controlled trials in the nephrology field. Here on the left, you can see the size of the different studies, the year of publication. And this illustration tries to, tries to illustrate, to some extent, the, the design of these studies. Placebo-controlled trials are indicated with a little triangle. And these are the target ranges against placebo, or from a certain point on, as you can see, only two different target ranges were compared, simply because it was felt that comparing placebo with treatment would no longer be ethically feasible. Over the years, the target ranges have increased more and more. And then what you may also appreciate from this graph is the achieved hemoglobin concentrations were always more close than the actual target ranges in per protocol. And of course, this limits the, um, this limits the conclusion from these trials. The main limitation, however, is that if we summarize all these trials, about 30 have been published, and only 7,500 patients have been included in these trials, and only four randomized controlled trials included more than 500 patients. Now, this situation has changed and has led to this uh, intense debate that we are currently witnessing. This has changed with TREAT, the largest trial in the field, and you can easily see how the 4,000 patients enrolled into this trial dominate the discussion and, of course, also all meta-analysis. And the important issue about TREAT is that, once again, after a long lag period, this trial has actually tested treatment against placebo. Now, I don't have time to go through all of these studies, and I don't have time to go through the more important ones, but what I would like to do is try to summarize the main results of those six trials that have actually enrolled more than 500 patients. And the way I'm trying to do this is a little table here with all these different trials, and nephrology in the audience are very familiar with all of them. Just to remind you briefly, this was a study in patients on dialysis, prevalent patients with high mortality, in the the normal hematocrit study. This was a smaller trial in incident patients on dialysis, and the subsequent trials were done in patients not yet on dialysis with a different degree of estimated GFR at enrollment, different, uh, different sample size, treat with more than 400, as I mentioned already, different proportion of diabetics, and slightly different target hemoglobin concentrations. These are the results of these trials, and again, there's no point here within very few minutes to go through all of the details. And what I've tried to do to visualize the results of these trials, I'm, I've tried to use a color coding here with a light yellow for 
some indication of risk, albeit not statistically significant, a somewhat darker yellow for significant changes, and on the other hand, green color for benefits shown by these trials. And I hope you can easily see when using such a color code, and I must say again, non-significant risk is totally arbitrary here. This is not a specific hazard ratio. This is just looking at the numbers and looking at the trends here. But I think what you can see here is there are far more yellow than green, if any. And the result, the reason, most recent result that has risen particular concern, of course, is the increase in strokes that was observed in the TREAT study. Now, you could argue that the more parameters you look at, there is a chance, then, of course, to find something that is positive. However, this is a pretty strong effect. It's a duplication of the number of stroke events and has led to a significant interest in this uh, sort of complications in patients treated with darbipoetin. The main risk factor for stroke, not unexpectedly, is a history of stroke. But it is important to note that the risk associated with darbipoetin treatment in the TREAT trial was not restricted to those who already had a stroke, but it was equally obvious in those who had not yet had a stroke, although the absolute risk, of course, is smaller in the group with no history of stroke. The hazard ratio, it's the way, it, it depends on how you want to look at it. Of course, this hazard ratio is somewhat higher, but the confidence intervals are totally overlapping, and I think one shouldn't overinterpret this data and be clear about the risk in all individuals. Now, another risk that was obvious in TREAT, and I thought this would certainly provide the links to some of the discussion issues that were discussed previously, cancer. Um, overall, cancer-related adverse events, death in patients with cancer and deaths attributed to cancer were not significantly different, but in a subgroup of individuals with a history of malignancy, and this, this is about uh, slightly less than 10% of the whole study population, all-cause mortality tended to be higher, but not statistically significant, and the deaths attributed to cancer were higher in the darbipoetin arm than in the placebo arm. So coming back to this table, there's an issue of real concern here. Although, and I'll come back to this, as you will also see, there's a significant degree of inconsistency with some studies suggesting a mortality rate, treat clearly not showing this, some studies showing an increased uh, prevalence or incidence of congestive heart failure, treat also not showing this, so there are inconsistencies. These are the risks. What about the potential benefits of this kind of therapy? Shown in green here is the quality of life benefit. And again, I don't want to go into this, but all the analysis that are available seem to indicate that there is some benefit, but that the magnitude of this benefit is pretty moderate, at least when we compare subnormal hemoglobin concentrations with moderate anemia. The other Clear benefit that all trials have demonstrated is a reduction in red cell transfusions. These are the data from TREAT. A clear and impressive uh, difference in the number of transfusions, but it's important to know that also in the treatment arm, transfusions were not totally avoided. The number of transfusions was significantly reduced. And there are a couple of interesting issues here, and I just want to mention one of them, which is publicly available on the, so on the internet because uh, it is part of the materials that were provided for a recent FDA meeting. And as you can see here, interestingly, and I do not understand this, maybe somebody has a clue here, this difference in transfusion is mainly due to a much higher transfusion rate in the placebo group in North America as compared to other parts of the world, indicating, fully understood, I would say, of important regional differences. Now, what about balancing risks and benefits? Also, materials that are available here on the internet, absolute annualized event rate, placebo group as compared to the darbipoetin group, comparing stroke and transfusion reduction. And what this basically says is that there are three more patients who experience a stroke for five pa less patients who do not need to be transfused. And I think there's little debate about the fact that this risk-benefit relationship is not positive. So one of the questions is, can we then identify some subgroups in which this risk-benefit relationship may be different? And uh, this led to a secondary analysis, which was more recently published in the New England Journal, 
And uh, what the investigators did in this case, they actually separated patients according to the initial response to the first two doses of darbipoetine. These first two doses were weight-based and were not adjusted to the response, not adjusted to the hemoglobin level. And these are the four different quartiles that resulted from this analysis. And as you can see, what happens here as response to the initial doses is a sort of persistent phenomenon because also in the early and in the late phase of the study, these quartiles still separate out. Of course, those, who show the, those patients who show the poorest response then, over the course of the study, receive the highest doses of darbipoetin because they are up-escalated, whereas the good responders continue to receive or will receive the lowest doses and is in a, with an opposing trend, nevertheless, the hemoglobin concentrations are higher in those that show a good response for right from the beginning. The interesting finding here is that the response to the initial first doses seems to predict prognosis in these individuals. This is the proportion of patients experiencing one of these adverse events. So the steeper the curve, the poorer the prognosis. And as you can see here, the patients in the quartile with a poor initial response clearly had a significantly worse prognosis as compared to those with a better initial response and as compared to those with a placebo. Now, the interesting hypothesis that can be derived from these data is, of course, that maybe treatment has an impact in making the prognosis worse in those individuals who show a poor response and therefore need very high doses. However, we have to recognize that one of the, one of the limitations, necessary limitations, according to the study protocol, is that we do not know the prognosis of poor responders within the placebo group because we are unable to identify them, they haven't received the drug. It is possible that their prognosis is not changed, and this would then speak for a treatment effect, but at the same time, we cannot exclude that the prognosis of poor responders in the placebo group is unchanged from that who were treated with darbipoetine. So this is something that might be addressed in future studies. So let me conclude this brief overview. Let me try to summarize a couple of questions and issues that currently are sort of in the center of the debate. Let me first start with comparing moderate anemia as compared to subnormal hemoglobin concentration because here is where we have most of the trial data. There's a consistency, I would say, of the trials in showing that they all show some trends at least towards risk. However, there's inconsistency in the type of risk. You've seen the yellow colors in different fields. Some studies showed Accelerated progression to dialysis, others have not confirmed this. The stroke risk that was seen in TREAT has not been seen in other studies. I do not think that we fully understand why the risk spectrum is different. Also, overall, and I repeat that, there's consistency of the charts. Secondly, there's uncertainty about the cause of this risk. Is it related to the actual hemoglobin level? Is it related to off-target effect of ESAs? Um, the only thing I can say here, it is more complicated than just the hemoglobin level. If you look at patients who experience a stroke, it is not that these individuals had a very high hemoglobin, above 14, something like that. In fact, they had lower hemoglobin than those who did much better in the trial. There's an uncertainty about the risk-benefit relationship in individual patients and patient subgroups. We can only formulate this data for the whole population. And then there's something which I think is, is very important. The perceived benefit in patient-reported outcomes that our patients tell us about and that a practicing physician experiences tends to be at discrepancy with the objective benefit that was measured in the trials using the clinical trial instruments. And this is something that gives us an uneasy feeling and we don't really understand what the cause is. It may be that the placebo effect does play an important role and the trials with the placebo groups actually indicate that there's a strong placebo effect. But we also have to consider the possibility that the instruments that we are currently using may be insufficient to really pick all the relevant uh, patient-reported outcomes. New trials needed in the area. There's a lot of discussion to this, and I'm happy to address this also in the discussion later on. Secondly, these open questions also open up again the area of 
What about treating severe anemia? If the risk-benefit relationship is so uncertain in patients with moderate anemia, how sure can we be that treating severe anemia is associated with a positive risk-benefit relationship? And the only thing I can say here, we do not have hard outcome data in the CKD population comparing no treatment as to um, hemoglobin levels around 9 or 10. And there are very limited data on patient-reported outcomes. These data suggest, however, that the increase in patient-reported outcomes, the improvement in patient-reported outcomes, is much more relevant when you go from no treatment to partial correction of anemia as if you go from partial correction to complete correction of anemia. So with this, I'd like to conclude, and I'm happy to discuss other issues during the discussion.